I'm in Thames, New Zealand at a farm I was at pretty much this time last year and it was called Adama Farm then, it's called Pakaraka Permaculture now and I'm just going to talk to Yotam who I talked to last year, in fact we talked about this exact strawberry patch last year, some of you guys who follow my videos probably recognize this, Yotam's going to talk about that strawberry patch and he's kind of just taken me on a little bit of a tour of the farm so I'll kind of splice together things he's showing me as and as as well as things that I'm going to check out myself. This is a strawberry patch again. This will be the same plants that I've planted about a year and a half ago. Did you thin did you thin them out at the end of the season? I didn't thin them out. What I did was I used the scythe and um, and we've taken all the foliage out to let it regenerate. So you chop you chop from right down to the, the ground? Yeah basically? a few centimeters yeah, above yeah. the crown. Yeah. Um, and then we fed that to the chickens, grabbed the runners, and then we used them to plant another little patch. You can see over there. But, oh yeah, you um, extended it a bit? Yeah, I extended it. And from those, those new ones gave us a lot of bigger ones, uh -huh. and more consistent, and generally a, like a healthier crop. And these ones, we had so much rain in the beginning of the season. So they just rotting? Almost like 100 kilos between October and November just trotted away. Damn. And we still picked them to get the field clean. Yeah. And I was, I was just about to pull half of these beds out and put something else in. And then the sun came? And then my wife told me, be patient, be patient. And it, wor it was worthwhile. We sold 400 kilos of strawberries. And with this and the new pack, yeah, 400 kilos. 400 kilos at a, an wow. average of Considering 20. that you had such a bad start, yeah, that's pretty damn good. I was so happy. I listened to my wife. Um, wow. <laughs> so really, this year we've been managing um, all, of, all the whole operation together. Um, and besides the 400 kilos of sellable ones, we've had about 100 kilos that I've fro that have frozen in our chiller, in our freezer, and that I've made sauce with. Huh, I've got nice. about 25 liters of ready-made like strawberry sauce. Beauty. Yeah. Beauty. Um, so the old patch gave us, uh, as we anticipated, more but smaller ones. It also took a lot longer to harvest the, the older patch. We've now, um, yeah, like considerably, considerably um, more time. So what we're going to do next, this year, after we grab the runners, we're going to take all of them out and we're going to plant this size again over on that side. And we're gonna make sure that we have about two thirds of new plants and about a third of older plants. Yeah. Because these plants gave more like weight in total. I think we pa we passed um, like yeah, the expected yield per plant here. Wow. And so we've put in the mulch so yeah, the like new runners the can go in. in. Yeah, that's yeah. nice. Because I'm really hoping the runners will be healthier this year. By so those plants over there look really healthy now, but yeah. they had a lower slower start. So this year we're gonna make sure the runners are really pumping it. And we're also going to offer our runners in the crowdfunding campaign for our solar system. Oh, there you go. Right on. Yeah, yeah. Right on. Um, yeah, what I would do differently is I would um, slash them. I'll take the top off later in the season. It looked like it was getting really cold in April. Um, so I thought, okay, frost is imminent. Let's do it. So um, any disease will be kind of killed by the frost. Yeah. But then it became warm again and we only had a frost in June. Right. So I was not really happy with that. Right. But as that's so is that the what's the plan um, going into your fall or is it late summer that you cut these? So we finished harvesting these um, maybe two three weeks ago. Our season's en ended. So there's we're still lucky a few. Enough. There's still little ones in there though. Yeah, right? you would find some to eat, but the quality is yeah, lower and it takes sellable. ages. So we've sp we've been spending about 20 hours a week harvesting strawberries for about two months. Oh yeah, right. Uh, from this little patch, but um, but it was worth it. Yeah. Um, I would have next time, if I knew it's going to be as wet, I would put cloches and plastic cloches on top. I think that would have saved our crop. Yeah, hey, I might yeah. even try to do any, any how, whatever the season is, I'll try and do that to kind of um, stagger the, um, the harvesting. So mm -hmm. maybe some will start yielding earlier. There's still lots of flowers. If, if it won't be rainy, I think we'll still, I'm actually surprised how much more strawberries we could still get. The plants are in a mode of, of fruit still and not runners. There's hardly any runners here. Yeah. Um, so it is really interesting. But yeah, I guess it comes, it, it gets to a point of cost benefit analysis. It's like mm. those berries are so small. Is it worth, how much is it worth yeah. to go and spend the time to pick them? Because yeah. they're harder to pick when yeah. they're smaller too. It takes more time and you can't sell them for the same price. So um, actually we sold it for the same price 
for the whole whole season. Oh, did you? Maybe okay. we took a few dollars off, but yeah. still an average of twenty dollars a kilo. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So really good, really premium strawberries. They're, they're just amazing quality, and that's why we really want to make sure that the, our quality is is just out there. So we don't want to harvest them when the quality is lower. Yeah, exactly. Um, if it would have been, if this would have been a nat like a normal year, I didn't, I wouldn't need so many forerunners. So if this wasn't for the crowdfunding campaign, we would, um, I would pull pretty much all of these out and only use the runners from there because we're yeah. going to get um, probably a few thousands of runners from this. So I'm going to offer a bundle of about 20 strawberries um, with some planting information. Oh yeah, um, nice. Yeah, so I would have pulled it out now and I would plant lettuces right. or something here. Nice, and nice. something I would do different is I would definitely drip underneath. So these haven't been dripped just because I didn't have the... Um, the triples at the time. Yeah. You can see how much. You could still run them over top and just I could, pin I them could, down. I could, but I still need to, um, yeah, to install it and buy it. But I will, I will for the other patch. Um, you can see how the top kind of three beds are a lot, like, to me, they look healthier. And that's because they got the excess water from the greenhouse. That's right. The water running down the greenhouse comes right in here. So it, you can, you can actually see it very visibly. Yeah. 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 yeah so that's interesting. I would make sure to water more next year. Yeah. Compensate down here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but interesting. It, was, it ended up being an awesome season. I was, yeah, I'm really happy we didn't take them out when, just because I felt, like, <laughs> <laughs> we, because by the time, by the end of November, we've utilized every piece that we can in the garden. Yeah, so exactly. looking at something that's not producing what it's worth. Yeah. Um, yes. This is cool because the runners go into the mulch and I probably reckon it's not too hard just to pull them out of here, right? It's gonna be so easy. So easy, so that's, underneath. that's a brilliant, part about putting the mulch on top of the fabric yeah right wow yep. that's cool yep. and i still wouldn't recommend planting them without without weed mat what i would maybe do is this is a very vigorous plant if i would have made the holes again i'd maybe give them another five to ten centimeters room in between oh, to yeah. have more airflow yeah although something really interesting so a plant like this that relatively has more airflow yeah i would have still found rotten ones under. right so even if some plant was in the edge um it still suffered the same fungus as everything else. So it wasn't really an issue of, of air circulation, but I think generally you should look, or I, I would, should have looked at this specific variety and made um, accommodate for its larger spacing. We had more damage from ants this year than from birds. So again, I didn't net anything here. Uh, lost maybe five to 10% of the crop, more like 5% um, to those wild animals. But the only thing we sprayed here was seaweed. And we heavily fertilized the beds, lots yeah. and lots of fertilizer. I decided to make this my high rotation area because okay. it's the easiest area for me to cultivate. Right. So having like five crops here a season in each bed. Yeah. So I've made... You do five crops per season per bed? At least, well, because okay. there's nothing here that stays long. Yeah. And, um, and all of the other areas, I'm actually um, intentionally harvested more, I, I planted more um, biannual crops because it's harder for me to cultivate. And it's worked out really, really well. Yeah. I'm just about to pull these ones out. Right. Um, that makes a lot of sense. So I ran out of space. So I'm not religious. So I ran out of space and I had to plant these. I didn't have area in other places. So I planted them here. <laughs> uh, no question. No. And we sell sorrel. We still sell violas. This bed is coming out because the new patch has just started. We have you done sorrel as a microgreen? Yes, um, it's a lot more expensive to produce because there's less in a tray and it takes really long. Yeah. But I don't do it over summer because my basil is really satisfactory. But in winter I'm going back to this and shervil yeah. as well. Yeah. So just leeks for ourselves, we did onions for ourselves. I'm saving seeds from these babies. So reducing is that my cost. and over? That you're going to try and save the seeds? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to save it. There shouldn't be a reason why it won't work. Yeah. But, um, so this is one of my favorite ones. Because it's summer, they kind of, um, they won't grow as big as in spring and, not, and autumn. But this is just amazing. Should be a bit bulkier. Yeah, yeah, um, no, that's nice. And my eggplants were also um, something really spectacular this year. I have grow, I germinated them in August with my tomatoes, and they came up after five days as seedlings. Which and and I have had a crate full by the end week, by the last week of December, and a crate full every week since. Um, hey, what, what's that variety called? Bartok. It's a Bartok. it's a it's a hybrid one okay. from um, specialty seeds, and it's just amazing at an average price of ten dollars a kilo. I'm, I'm amazed how tight you're planting. It's like a thick bed. I'm doing bio-intensive planting. Yeah, like John Jevons density. Yeah. Yep. And when I calculate, and this year, if I, I'm sure my yields are 
are getting so much better. I've never had such a big yield from eggplants. Um, I can calculate how much I earn from this, but this is like a super high value crop for me this wow. year. Wow. How um, much per kilo can you sell it again? Um, I started with about $14 a kilo because nobody even like had them a fruit ripe, like flowering really. Yeah. Um, I got them two months earlier than everybody else because I put them in, under cloches and germinated them early. So the, the first crates were $14 a kilo and then the other ones were $10 a kilo. So a crate would be 15 kilos at least. So 15 Damn. kilos, I had maybe 10 weeks of that already, 150 kilos. Yeah, you know, this is um, over like $1,500 from this yeah. little little patch wow. of eggplants. Purple daikon radish. These are golden beets. He says he harvests about 400 grams per flat. Here in New Zealand, it's sometimes hard to get a lot of the things that we take for granted in North America. One of them, the things that they have a hard time finding down here is flats for microgreens. So I use a one inch deep 1020 flat. Yotam's using, I think it's fantastic. He's using sort of like cafeteria trays, plastic cafeteria trays. I've seen other growers use these before, but they're using an aluminum one, which are a lot more expensive. I think he said to get those down here, 25 bucks a piece. So he's getting these for I think six dollars a piece. So that's a really nice shallow um, tray that New Zealanders could use. It looks like it's about 35 by 45 centimeters, something like that in size. Yotam's going to talk about some of his microgreens and what he's doing and uh, how he's making a salad mix out of them. So what are your what are your what are your prime microgreen crops? What are your best ones? Um, we were doing about 16 to start with and we downsized. We did a lot of analysis of how much it costs us to produce each variety. Yeah. And now we've gone down to two types of basil. We've got green basil and this is pretty much ready for harvest. That's just sort of a standard sweet basil that yeah, looks similar Genovese to what I've done. Basil. Yeah, I Genovese. just buy the organic okay. one and I use it. Um, I do about... Um, about eight trays twice a week of this stuff and I blend it into our microgreen rainbow mix and into our salads with lettuce. It just makes the salads so flavorful. So flavorful. And yeah. the purple one, um, I use, let it go bigger, I use it to, um, I only put it in the rainbow microgreen mix because it's more expensive to produce because the seeds are twice the price. Right. Um, so basil is a staple in the warmer months. I can grow it maybe eight months of the year and when that's not available, I grow micro soil, micro coriander and chervil. Yeah. We've got red granet amaranth, which is an absolute stunner. I mix it in both microgreen rainbow mix and in the best salad. It goes a really long way compared to the beets, because if I use bull's blood, bull's blood beets or red beet stems, they... They get lanky. They get lanky, they break more. Yes. Um, and also there's a lot less stems, so there's a lot less of leaves in... Yes. In the salad, so this gives this can give about 250 300 grams a tray, yeah, and it's a stunner. Tray. We are now we we are now doing about um six trays twice a week of this, and I should probably up it a bit. So, is this what another five days to harvest? Then more, more. I, I, I stopped growing things young, um, I don't have anything to show for this. Actually, will probably be a week away, okay, at least. Um, so I'm not gonna harvest this on this coming Monday, now we're Saturday, probably next. Thursday could even be more. Okay. So we're taking things longer. But How long is the total date to maturity on that from seed to harvest? I stopped measuring this time of year because I just sow them twice yeah, a week. Yeah, keep sowing. Yeah. And um, it's such an easier way of um, some part of the year I sow at different days of the week, so they will all be prime on a specific day. But because we grow everything in natural conditions, yeah, then we, I don't have control over that. Yeah. So sometimes something you, something would take like basil, it could take three weeks and it could take two weeks. Right. And it all depends if the sun or not. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I would say this is around, to get it to the size I want, I'd say it's probably two and a half weeks. Yeah. Could even go for free. So this is, I used to harvest the basil like this. Yeah. And this would have given me maybe 250 grams. Okay. And and it will produce, it will, it will look nice. But if you look at this compared to this stuff. Oh yeah. This, this is, is going to bring me double. That's going to be yeah, 450 for sure. grams. For sure. Pretty much. I don't think I reached One pound. Five, I, wow. Yeah, I think one pound. Yeah, so another, another like, I don't know, five days or another yeah. few more days. I don't, like I don't spend more time on this. I've got the space yeah. for it because yeah. I can even put them underneath. Yeah. Um, I can st they, they stay stacked for a few days, like yeah. you can see over there in the bottom. Yep, yeah. yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. And um, this one's actually 
we keep moving. This one is a disease happening here. I should probably take it out. I'll take it out in fact just now. I don't mind wasting things. I always sow a little bit more and my blend mm, always yeah. changes. Yeah. I always prefer um, to keep the sanitation as high. Oh, yeah. So the reason that is diseased, I should probably, I can also... That one too is a little bit. Yeah, and that's, it's that's just, the end. It's just, it's just mold, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, it, is, it is rotting. Um, yeah. I'm always playing with my green, with my tunnel houses. Nothing is heated, but I do have different conditions for my tunnel houses. This one is the hottest one. And I, I kept it bare for microgreens in the hottest weeks of the year because I thought I'll use this mesh to dehydrate some food, but I didn't get to it. <laughs> and, nice. and then I said, okay, I need the space because my other tunnel house was really full. Um, and, and I put the basil in here. But what I'm finding is that the basil get diseased here because yeah. I think of lack of ventilation. So I'm yeah. going to move it back to where it thrived with no yeah. problem. Yeah. And I've bought a shade cloth, 30% white one. Uh -huh. And I'm going to put it here and then I can move and make it less hot. And with the side wall that I've got, um, really nice installation. And I'm gonna make this a perfect haven for sunflower shoots. Right. So nice. I can have all of this in sunnies yeah. and all the basil and amaranth right. are gonna yeah, go over here. Go. So I divide, so you, these are, this is another type of amaranth, that's amaranth tricolor or uh, Mekong red, it's um, by the trade name. It, it's not as red, it's pinkish. The bottom of the leaves are really pretty. Yeah. It goes to it be. It almost looks like orac. It does. It's similar it does. to uh, amaranth. But the, chips are, the seeds are cheaper than orac and really prolific. Yeah. Um, I tried orac in experiments, but I kind of made myself a point to stop buying these things that cost no. like $100, $120 yeah. um, a kilo. Yeah. Just too much. Um, yeah. So, um, so I, I, I went down from that. We can have a look what else is interesting in here. Uh, sure. Well, how about we? I use these ones to. Yeah, yeah that's like I do. It's so, plus. so they don't drip on the bottom yeah. ones. Bamboo let's, is local. Got the thermometer. Let's here. let's let's talk about your mix. Yeah. So is, is this your rainbow mix? Yeah, that's our microgreen rainbow mix, and it's changed a lot. When the, this is our third year of farming here, and it has now the red amaranth. Look what the standard it is, and we've got the basil. We've got some opal basil somewhere here. We've got radish rainbow, That's, like purple yeah. radish, yeah. which is the only is that kangi like a thing. radish? Yeah, yeah people. Yeah. yeah, it has different names. I don't. I'm I, I'm I'm putting it. It's look. It looks really nice when it's younger and it gives a lot of weight and it's a bit of tangy. But we stopped doing rocket because it was too hot for people. And yeah. I'm not sure if I should make a sweet and a more spicy mix. We took less must. We put we put maizuna in here. We put a bit stem. Red stem kale. Yeah, you got some pea shoots in there. Yeah, a little bit because they shoots. make it a little bit more fluffy. Yeah. This is one of my favorites. This is usually it has a longer stem. It's a bit broken. It yeah. always gets a bit it's it's just a really sensitive. Golden beet. Or yeah, or exactly. Chard. Actually, that's an expensive seeds. Very expensive. But seed. it's worth it. It makes the salad look. There's nothing else that produces yellow. Yeah, it's, that's right. It's so, all like reds and greens and purples. Yeah. And then that's a, a, a golden yellow. So I yeah. do. Um, it's hard to say. I get now. I get an average of about three to four hundred grams of each tray I go. Like mm -hmm. I just have a policy now that I don't go things that produce it's me a hundred, a hundred fifty grams. Right, yeah. I stop this, yeah. um, and 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 I go maybe in a five kilo in a five kilo mix. I try to have something like um, half, like ten percent of the of the yellow ones. Sometimes goes down to five percent. Right. What else have we got here? I'm not sure. We really downsized. So there's about eight different types of micros here. We used to do sixteen, um, but we found out that the chefs don't mind. Yeah, they and don't care. we also made a mind shift, um, a switch, switch, switch shift. I don't know how to call it. That we are not producing to high-end restaurants. Yeah. We don't have um, really classy places that serve microgreens. What we do have is really quality. Like real quality restaurants, but are you know medium class, the right. restaurant cafes yeah. that um, buy a lot, use a lot, uh, make it available for people. Um, they want really high quality stuff. They want it fresh. They look it to, to taste and look yeah. amazing. But they don't need all the little um, really fancy stuff that makes it a lot more expensive for me that's, to produce. That's more ideal. So. Um, Man, I gotta say, your garden looks like 100% better than it did last year. It's, it's incredible how much you've changed with it. And you know, one addition you have now that's made your life easier is you got a walk-in cooler. Yes. You didn't, he didn't have a cooler when I was here last year and I was like, dude, you're crazy. You're nuts not having a walk-in cooler. But they've got one now, but your biggest issue 
Because you don't, it's hard to get the energy to, because you guys are completely off grid totally. here. We used for, I don't know, maybe the first almost two years, we went to a neighbor, which is a kilometer and a half away. And after we finished harvesting the salads and microgreens, we did it in a time that we can straight up send to all of our local customers and we refrigerate it overnight in a friend's. Oh and my. It was terrible. And it put so much pressure to harvest things early in the morning to get everything finished yeah, it before it gets your hot. Whole day. You can't, you, you have to just do the same rigid schedule every time. No flexibility. And yeah. I started off by when we were just in our first month, I woke up at 4 or 5 in the morning and delivered everything by 9 in the morning, like finished doing everything. That was so stressful. Yeah. I didn't want that life. Yeah. And then um, now that we have, and then we did it um, the day before and like started the day before, like um, did it on a Thursday, delivered um, all to, the, to all of the locals by the end of Thursday and um, refrigerated for Friday for our Auckland restaurants. And now that we've got the cooler, it's just so much easier. <laughs> so much easier. It means that I've got, I can I can harvest the lettuces and I can put them to cool down and they will be in the best Perfect. condition. Yeah. Everything. So now our salads keep for longer. They keep for 10 days from after yeah. harvesting in amazing conditions. I would never eat my salads a week after I harvested them. Yeah. Now I would eat them after 10 days and be really content yeah. with it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the cooler... Um, we didn't do it from the get-go because we, we didn't know how we're going to run it. Because right. now what we've done is we've bought um, a very efficient um, generator, mm -hmm. like sine wave generator. It uses about two and a half liters for almost 10 hours of running. Okay. And, and we bought the smallest cool room we think we can handle, um, really well insulated, double insulated the floor, and we got um, a high-end um, heat pump, air conditioning unit, really smart, um, the smallest size, it hooked it up to a cool boot, figured out that it uses four and a half kilowatts a day um, to run to get to about three degrees. Uh, 39 degrees um, Fahrenheit. Yeah. I know because my cool boot works on Fahrenheit. Oh, <laughs> you can switch it. I don't know how. I you can might show me. And we did the generator as a, as, as a temporary step for a solar system, but a solar system for, for that much energy and to be able to run um, at different months of the year is, is really beyond our means. So we've yeah. decided to crowdfund for it. So, okay. um, and we decided to even take a further step and to make all of our operation on solar. Yeah. And we're gonna buy an electric car that we'll use for our deliveries. That's awesome. We're gonna buy the most simple one that we can use for the local deliveries, um, just, the, just the car, and we're gonna hook up a trailer to it, a lightweight trailer. We're not meant to do it, but we know we can. We've heard of people do it. Yeah. And then we can go to our market. So we're gonna be like totally independent um, because we're all, anyway off grid, but we're going to be completely um, using the sun. So we're going to be oh, running yeah. on solar, yeah, running, running on, on sunshine. Yep. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So I will. I'll make sure I have the link for Yotam's crowdfunding campaign below. I don't know. You guys haven't made an official video no, for it yet, or we're, not? No, we're now the end of end of February. By the end of March, we're going to go live. We're going to shoot our video t um, next next week. We've got already lots of amazing rewards lined up. We've got the solar system, the solar sy solar company sponsoring us and giving us a reduced price for the system. Very cool. Um, our biggest restaurant we work with in Auckland, Little Bird Organics, is going to make a big farm to table. Nice, uh, nice. Yeah. You know, this is one thing that other market gardeners can learn from because market gardening is still so new and hip that a lot of people want to associate with young small scale farmers. And if you hit up these companies, and offer them promo promotions or some kind of equity trade, you can often get deals. So yeah. it's cool to see We're you've done super that. super ethical. We grow, um, on a quarter acre, we grow over seven tons of food a year. Um, we Seven metric tons. Yes. <laughs> uh, se kilos. Seven kilos. Seven. 7,000 kilos. 7,000 kilos, yeah. yeah. Which a is about 14, 16,000 yeah. pounds. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, we use, like, we don't do tillage. We use a broad fork, a fork. Um, yeah. We use lots of compost, really ethical, um, and we also reach, our food reaches to a lot of people now, middle of summer, our microgreens and salads reach out to over 1,500 people a week. That's and awesome. we've got other stuff that we're selling too. That's so, awesome, dude. Yeah. Cool, dude. Well, thanks for having us, yeah, and great. thanks for the microgreens and the lovely dinner, and uh, we'll see you next year. Fantastic. Looking awesome. forward to it.